Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you're staying safe and protecting yourselves accordingly. While much of the world is rightly focused on the pandemic, we now have some alone time to ponder things, and I'm looking forward to when we come out of it, as we surely will. Before starting this show last year, I recalled something I heard over 14 years ago from a senior citizen visiting Panama for the first time. He thought Medicare needed to collapse to fix it the right way. He wasn't at all hopeful of a fix. He was looking for a phoenix solution, rising from the ashes. I call that a do-over, like when you were a kid and the actual results didn't fit the desired outcome. Mind you, that's well before Obamacare. I've heard from many physicians that our current problems go back for many decades. A slow-motion train wreck is what we have now. Frankly, I was getting to the point of wanting to bust the whole thing up, too. Massive disruption. Think not just Blockbuster to Netflix, but more like the three regulated broadcast networks to Netflix. The question was, how to do it? Now I'm thinking we can do it without leveling the whole thing but also thinking, what's the tipping point? During the 2014 Ebola outbreak, ER physician Dr. Louis Profeta wrote an article sharing one critical question not being asked at the time. Dr. Profeta, will they, the staff, you, your partners, show up? His answer, that I don't know. Most hospitals are prepared for mass casualty events such as an earthquake or terrorist attack, some more than others, but Dr. Profeta was confident his hospital could handle those. All his team needed to know was the type of event and the number of patients. They knew from research that a mass casualty event would produce a certain number of injuries requiring immediate triage in their ER. They'd focus on the most serious first while others waited. However, it was a Spanish flu scenario that scared him the most. There's no way to prepare for it. Today's news reports about lack of ventilators, patients on gurneys and hallways, and shortages of protective gear for staff reinforce his concerns. His prophetic answer was driven by an experience earlier in his career. A large hospital system saw delays admitting ER patients to their hospitals. As patient backlog grew, ER overcrowding increased, which affected all the ER patients. The hospital studied all the variables, including lab testing time, how long x-rays took, and much more. They discovered the roadblock was housekeeping, Rooms were not clean fast enough, resulting in delays. But those housekeepers weren't being lazy. In fact, they're highly trained. Cleaning protocols, rules, and regulations were slowing things down to a crawl. That set off a chain reaction in the hospital. In a pandemic, more people stacking up in the ER getting infected, along with infecting the staff, was his nightmare scenario. I've linked his article in the description. It's worthwhile reading. So events pile up quickly when staff shortages and deaths from a pandemic shatter the confidence of less trained support staff such as security guards, orderlies, housekeepers, laundry, and food services. They'll simply say, sorry, not coming in. And who can blame them? Even doctors and nurses may think twice when they see mounting soiled linens, human waste, sick and dying bodies piled up as with the Spanish flu epidemic. Everyone has their breaking point. If they have family, their point will come sooner. And by the way, the Phoenix New Times just reported a nurse working for a large healthcare system quit her job over its refusal to issue personal protection equipment. In her case, an N95 mask. One more popped up on my Twitter feed. A Chicago ICU nurse 
posted an Instagram video about working in a dedicated COVID-19 unit. She brought her own N95 mask and was told she couldn't use it. She quit her job. Many can't do the same as they are the sole breadwinner for their families. They're also being told to keep quiet. And that will not end well if physician comments that I see are an indicator. Deeply frustrated, doctors are lashing out. They're getting fed up with hospital administrative staff becoming between them and their patients, not to mention governments at all levels. The boiling point may be in sight. There will be hell to pay when we get out of this. Given how much respect and public admiration for the docs and nurses on the front lines have, they'll win in court. And if you're wondering where that wrath is pointed, here's a chart of the healthcare administrative job growth. It's worth noting we should not only thank docs and nurses, but also support team members too. Without them, the whole thing collapses. You may not be able to hug them now, but thanking them for their service from a safe distance is highly appropriate. If your doctor is part of a large hospital system, you've probably noticed they're cutting back on office visits. Examining that lump may have to wait. This points to a major flaw in the U.S. system. Far too many people use ERs for their primary care. The old antiquated system forces that situation. Patients going to care instead of care going to them. Primary care practices in the old antiquated system are feeling the heat right now. Reports are that COVID-19 is having a severe impact on their practices. Many reported that clinicians, nurses, and front desk staff are unable to report to work due to illness or self-quarantine. Many are conducting telehealth visits, but are unsure of how they'll be reimbursed. Sidebar, if they were in the new system, telehealth wouldn't be an issue. It's been done for years. Due to all the rules and regulations and a herd of people in the exam room, more doctors gave up their private practices and joined hospital-based groups. That trend spotlights another major flaw in the system, the old one. After this is over, you're going to rethink just where is my doctor when it hits the fan? Logistics plays a role, just like supply chains for medical equipment and drugs. Do you really want to go where all the sick people are? In my opinion, and plenty of physicians agree, you should be thinking that way anyway. Until now, physicians were hard to herd in the right direction. One of them provided a very helpful quote. Herding docs is like herding a bunch of snarling jaguars. They aren't the herding type. But COVID-19 is providing a monstrous disruptive force, a medical tsunami of change once we emerge from this global nightmare. It's been a long time coming, too. The jaguars are becoming wolf packs. Long ago, my dad told me, son, when something bad happens, ask yourself what's good about it. Granted, that's tough to do right now, but worthwhile at some point, usually sooner than later. This pandemic has a lot more people thinking different. Here are a few bright spots from that change. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, their decisions affect over 140 million Americans and by default anyone with private insurance too. They're now allowing hospitals and health systems to transfer uninfected patients to ambulatory surgery centers for care. CMS now allows at-home COVID-19 testing by hospitals, laboratories, and other entities. Officials are telling or ordering people to stay home. This is forcing a disruptive change on primary care physicians. Most of them are limiting office visits to reduce exposure. The pandemic requires more time to sort through which patients need more hand-holding because of physical condition 
or mindset. To telescope time, docs are using phone and video calls, email and text messages to provide reassurance and handholding, guidance. Easier care access and better communication is here. Telehealth bridges the logistics gap. CMS relaxed rules to allow more than 80 additional services to be furnished via telehealth. Even previous rules preventing telehealth across state lines and billing for these services are now relaxed. CMS made their decision primarily due to logistics, moving care closer to patients, a key attribute of comprehensive primary care. Patients are loving their newfound timely access. They're no longer waiting for answers. They're getting them faster and right over the phone or a video chat. Nor are they forced into one medical problem per visit. Multiple issues are cared for in one call. This massive uplift of convenience, moving care closer to the individual, isn't escaping patients either. The question is, like an addict once offered an unlimited supply, will they go back to ration care access? I don't think so. Not willingly, anyway. Primary care docs are limited by too many rules and regulations in a hostile system. No wonder they've been seeking a way out. Their own Brexit was underway before this hit. Now far more will see the light and leave it by opting out. They'll be going direct payment and lower their prices, resulting in more affordable and much higher accessibility to great care. Hospital-employed physicians are taking notes right now. And they're loaded for bear when this pandemic is over. They're even thinking legal action against hospitals and health systems for gag orders, withholding protective gear and making medical decisions without a license to practice medicine. A call went out from physicians asking attorneys to help. And just like that, they're volunteering. Really. This has been a long time coming, too. Indeed, coronavirus is shining a bright light on restrictions in place from archaic rules and regulations, even some prohibiting health care providers from adding new hospital beds and services to opening new hospitals or being examined. Some states require them for adding drug rehabilitation services and hospice care to building new ambulatory surgery centers. They're called Certificate of Need or CON laws. 36 states plus the District of Columbia require them, even though the federal government repealed them back in the 1980s. Research is showing banning them altogether will provide greater access to higher quality, lower cost care. Just adding new beds right now is forcing states to revisit their con laws. This transformative disruption is rocking health care. Coronavirus 2020 just may be the tipping point to a far better system, and I sure hope so. The lessons learned remain to be seen, but one vital one is forcing its way to the top. Getting primary care right first. Without that, no matter what we do with coverage, we'll solve our health care problem. Something else that's positive in all this. We're repurposing drugs that were used for other uses. And that's got a lot of people thinking, what else can we do with them? our old drugs? A lot of research is going into this right now. A lot of trials. There's nothing like a pandemic to force the hand of old, archaic rules. I hope we'll have another show on that coming up soon, because repurposing drugs based on genome research offers a lot of possibilities. Please share your thoughts below in the comments section, and if you're open-minded and want to stay informed, please subscribe. Most of all, please stay safe at home or at a distance when you must go out. We'll get through this together. Thanks for joining me. Until next week, stay safe, 
wash your hands often, catch up with family and old friends, and there you are.